I can't resist the temptation any longer. I simply must spend an episode on Chop Robinson. Might be my favorite guy in the draft. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You like it on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we are always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much to those of you who listen to this show every single day, even in the lulls of February while we wait for other news to drop. Appreciate y'all so very much. You guys keep this thing going. If you're new here, hello and welcome. Happy to see you. My name is Luke. I'll be your host. You can find the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it's an audio listening place like the SiriusXM app uh, or anywhere else where you get podcasts, as well as YouTube and Amazon Fire and Roku if you download the Lockdown Minnesota Sports app. Today is Chop Robinson Day. I've decided... So here's the gig with Chop Robinson. He's Penn State edge rusher. We're going to do a lot of D-line stuff in the next couple months. It's what I'm going to sort of focus myself on. And, and my goal for this is to feel like I have a grasp on what separates a good D-lineman from a bad D-lineman beyond the obvious stuff that anyone can sort of guess with two seconds of critical thinking. They should be strong. They should be fast. They should be quick, right? Like we all understand that, right? And we'll look at the combine measurements and all that stuff when it comes in. But really what separates a a good defensive lineman from a bad one is less in the, the like measurable traits. That's almost more the ingredients to the cake um, and more in the effects that they can impose upon somebody. And this is why I have kind of gravitated into starting this D-line thing with Chop Robinson. So here's the thing about Chop Robinson. I freaking love this dude. Uh, This is as excited as I've ever been about a draft guy. And as I've sort of resolved to take the draft a little more seriously last year and, and now this year, um, than I did in previous years where I kind of would just like read whatever Dane Brugler wrote and say, ah, you know, I don't know anything. I'll just go with what those guys say. Here's what it, and relay things. I've tried to sort of establish my own ability to, to, to see what I'm looking for, right. To be able to find things that matter and, and see for myself, be a little more self-sufficient that way. And, uh, so that's kind of my journey for this year is to be able to do that with D line. So I understand that the Vikings have a lot of other needs on uh, in the draft. D-line is one of the huge ones. So I want to get through a lot of these guys because I think this is going to be like a day two, day three thing. Um, especially if the Vikings, you know, grab a quarterback. But that doesn't mean I'm going to neglect the, the guys that probably will be first round prospects. As it stands right now, if you look at like mock drafts and, and everybody's big boards and stuff, Chop Robinson does not show up at the top of a lot of people's lists. Uh, I... I'm just a lot higher than everybody else on him, and I'm at peace with that. You don't have to be here with me, but you are going to stop me from uh, going insane today about him. <laughs> and I also kind of think we'll, we'll see what happens after the combine because I think he might have good testing numbers, and that usually will like shoot a guy way up the board. Um, but with Chop, the things I like about him are the things I want to see in any edge rusher. And this is why it's such a good place to start, because it really lets me set a baseline for like, what am I looking for here in a def- defensive lineman? Um, now, I also I talked about Chop a little bit in a previous episode, like in one segment, I kind of said, yeah, I really love this guy, mostly because I just he was just like in my head and I needed to talk about it a little bit. But I'm going to do it a little bit more organized and serious this time. So what do I want to to see from an edge rusher in particular? Defensive tackle is a bit of a different game. And the thing that comes up over and over and over again. Anytime I talk to somebody who actually is like an an experienced expert in in coaching or maybe even evaluating defensive line is relentlessness uh, or mentality, or, you know, they'll use a lot of different words for it, but they're looking for a sort of, I mean, it's, it's effort, right? And effort is not something that I will typically call a player out for unless I really, really, really think that like it's bad and it, and it's, and it's not excusable. Uh, and I don't think, I think that's maybe happened here once. 
uh, when it's like, man, you lazed out on that play, right? Like, that's not what I'm ever talking about when I'm talking about effort. I'm talking about that extra mile effort um, that some guys have and some guys don't. I think if you don't have it, it's not so much a critique. It's just that the guys that do have it get extra points. Uh, and I think that's that's the, the biggest thing. I don't want my defensive ends to be like finessy little technicians that are trying to perfectly exactly Mr. Miyagi their way through every guy. I want them to be like the Tasmanian devil took bath salts. I want them to be frothing at the mouth, insane dudes with constant motion uh, and, and constant violence and just the relentless, never ending effort. Tasmanian devil on bath salts. That's what I'm looking for. That might be my comp for Chop Robinson. Actually, my comp for him is a is a melee player, a Super Smash melee player that mains Falco. It's just constant. You have to like constantly be countering every single move like at frames at a time and you're just exhausted by the end of it. And if you're over the age of like, I don't know, 35 and you didn't get that, that's okay. Go with the Tasmanian devil on bath salts. <laughs> It's the the mentality of not how do I outdo you, right? How do I out outspeed you or outstrength you or set you up and then knock you down? Um, it's like almost the exact opposite of what I'm looking for. I was thinking about like what's the opposite of the end? I think it's wide receiver uh, or maybe even quarterback. Like wide receiver to me is a really cerebral position. It's very there's no wasted motion. Everything is okay. I'm going to stem I'm going to hit, you know, my route break at 13 yards and I'm going to stem it out just to the outside of the hash and, and attack the outside hip of the corner and then, you know, three steps to sink my hips and then I'm going to break and I'm going to bubble that route up a yard and then bring it back down too so that I'm working back to the quarterback and then I'm going to catch and and you know, look the ball in and and then play football from there. It's all very cerebral and it's all very precise. That's a precision position to me. Whereas defensive end, I don't want precision. I don't want you to be delicate at all with anything. That is a position of explosion and violence and relentlessness. Chop has this in spades. Chop is the most one of the most relentless defense. I can't even think of a guy that like he reminds me of that's just that completely insane and relentless. Um, and one of the things that helps him with this is that his get off is insane. And this is what what you will see a lot. In, in draft scouting reports, because it's one of the easiest things to see, so every writer's going to pick it up, is get off. You can just pause the video two frames in and see who, who got off faster, uh, and, and it's always chop. Um, and what, what do you owe that to, right? Like, how do you get a better get off? And, well, there's two things. One is probably just raw ability, right? Just straight-up athleticism, strong legs, explosion, great, explosive athlete. I think he's going to test really, really well and be a very explosive athlete once we get all the combine numbers and the relative athletic score stuff is going to come out. And then everyone's going to be like, I love this guy. Um, let the record be known. I was here before he tested. <laughs> um, but also it's stance. So when, you, when you're looking for a D-line stance, especially an edge rusher stance, he will rush out of a two-point stance sometimes and a three-point stance sometimes. And when two-point and three-point, if you're not familiar, I, I want to make sure everybody's caught up here. So if you are like, what do you mean am I familiar with a three-point stance? Bear with me here, all right? Um, but that's three things on the ground, left foot, right foot, and a hand, right? That's your three-point stance and two-point stance, just your feet. That's what it is. Uh, so he'll, he'll rush out of both of those. Sometimes he'll actually line up in a two point stance. And then right before the snap, he'll get down into a three point stance, like right away. And then use that to help him, him push off. But really what you want to see, no matter if you're in a two point or a three point, a three point, you're bending down, you're a little bit more coiled. Uh, and you want to, a phrase I heard that I like a lot is you want a Cobra mentality. You want to be nice and coiled up like a Cobra ready to strike. So you want most of your weight uh, should be on your on like distributed between your feet. You want about even weight on your feet, maybe a little bit more on your back foot so that you can push harder off of that back foot more easily. But you don't want it all on your back foot because then your weight's going to be like on your heels and you're going to have to kind of lurch your body forward. And that's a little slower. Right. And you want a little bit of weight on your front hand, just a little bit of weight on your front hand. You don't want it to just be like kind of nudging the grass, which is actually kind of what you want on O-line. Um, but on D-line, you don't want your hand to to be, you want it firmly in the grass, 
because a it's a balance thing. If you've got your weight distributed in your feet in a weird way, your hand can sort of be stabilizing so you don't tip over. Uh, but also it can help you get you, you, you use that hand, you push off from your stance and you get your shoulders up to where they're supposed to be. But you don't want to stand way up. So you just want a little weight on that hand. Chops is picture perfect. It's a fantastic stance. Uh, the way that his weight is distributed, the way that it is coiled, um, the tension in his back leg when he's ready to push off of it and go, it's really, really, really good. It's one of those things where you can tell he's rehearsed it. And one one theme that you're going to get in this show is I've heard a lot of people and I've read tried to read scouting reports because I don't really get why he's not going like in the top five of drafts sometimes. Like it feels like he's that kind of blue chip guy that's going to go really high in the draft. Um, and a lot of the reason people give for that is that they see him as unrefined and I just couldn't disagree more. Uh, I, I see a lot of refinement in his game and it's stuff like that, that it's the stance looks textbook. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be to maximize your power and your explosion. And I'm going to guess he's got some pretty good natural gifts in that realm as well. Now, there are some negatives. We will get to those. And I also want to get to some of the other really cool technique stuff that he does. So uh, we have quite a bit of raving to go left to Locked on Vikings. Thank you to Nissan, sponsor of today's episode of Locked on Vikings. They have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take whatever your next adventure is to the next level. Check out the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It's perfect for city drives and great escapes because it is uh, built in with a whole bunch of Google devices, and this is all class exclusive, so you don't have to connect your phone and mess with Bluetooth or an aux cable or something and like have to pull over because the app isn't working or whatever. Gone are the days. How about Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store all installed right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. And why don't you check out the Nissan Armada, which will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. This baby can fit eight people in first class luxury and style in a rugged 4x4 that can tow bigger and explore further. Comfy on the inside, tough on the outside. Take Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Moving on with this episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. Look, this is a podcast, uh, so if you're more of a visual learner, you want to see this stuff on tape, I can't show it to you on this show, but I can show it to you on patreon.com slash NFL, where I'm working on a video that should be up soon, uh, and you can go uh, join there. See me break it down right in front of your eyeballs. But let me continue to assault your earballs because everything Chop Robinson does is an attack on the sanity of the person playing across from him. Because of that mentality, that relentlessness, that toughness, that constant violence, honestly, he looks like hell to play against. And the last guy I remember having that thought when I watched his college tape was Christian Derrissaw. I was going like, my God, these dudes just do not look like they're having fun by the end of a game against Christian Derrissaw. I think he ruined football for some people. Um, and I think Chop might be the same way. So there's some other like really more subtle, nuanced stuff. Now, there's a, there's a Bruce Lee quote that I love, which is the, the, the best technique is no technique. Your technique is my technique. When you move, I move. And when you do something, I respond to it. And that's, that's an awesome Bruce Lee quote about this kind of stuff. And I, and I do tend to get a little bit too deep into the technique weeds, but it's because I like it. So deal with it. I don't know. You're, you're not my boss. Uh, unless you're literally Ross listening to this. Then you are, I guess. So... Probably you aren't my boss, but when I hear somebody say, you know, refinement or I, I, I look for, you know, oh, he's got to build this part of his game or he doesn't, you know, know how to use it yet. And he's all raw skill. I think what you're looking at is or I think what people are, are seeing is that Chop Robinson is constantly moving his hands and constantly moving his feet. And that's something you drill. That's something that you want. In fact, like in warm up drills or in drills that you do like every single day at practice, You'll, you'll chop those feet and you'll chop those hands every time you do something. And, you know, then you'll hear the whistle and you'll punch or you'll, you'll, you know, practice a move or something, whatever it is that you're drilling. But usually in the meantime, you're chopping your feet and you're chopping your hands. And, you know, you're, they'll, they'll tell you like, you know, wax on, wax off, right? Uh, or, or just kind of chop up vegetables with your hands, you know, that like just keep them going at all times. 
Uh, and, and he's, you can tell that that habit's been very much instilled in him. And it makes it really difficult if you're an offensive lineman to get purchase on this guy. You can't counter his hands because they're moving every which way all over the place. But that is definite, like, like intentional chaos. Uh, <laughs> that's a great name for the, I think I just named the Patreon video for, for Chop Robinson. Because everything is intentional chaos. And it's really difficult to, to bring that in and bring it back under control if you're a tackle and that's your job. Um, when it comes to his feet now, I mean, look at a certain point in an, in a pass rush, your feet are just indiscriminately chopping. You're just trying to drive someone. Right. Um, but in those first few steps, they should all serve a purpose. You don't want false steps. You don't want to, uh, be taking, you know, too many tiny steps that'll just close you down. You want to do something with those steps. And very often he does something with those steps, depending on what his hands are doing. His hands and his feet move in conjunction. And they work with each other to accomplish the same goal. You don't see that with every. You don't see that with everybody in the pros. Um, I mean, there are some guys that that just don't do that, and therefore they aren't the most prolific pass rushers. And hey, that might be okay because their game might be something else. But maybe one of the more subtle, nuanced things that you sort of have to like really, really slow down to even be able to discern is okay. So on run plays, right? Most of the time, an edge rusher is going to have the C gap that's outside the tackle. He's going to want to park himself on the outside shoulder of the tackle and, and flash all the color in the world and say, look, here's my entire Jersey and my pads. You, sh you cannot go to this gap running back. You got to cut this thing back and go somewhere else. That's your job, right? You want to funnel them back in. That's um, called box fitting. And it's something that Penn state did a lot. Uh, and when you're doing that, you still want to keep those feet moving. As soon as your feet stop, it's a lot easier to like pick you up and drive you if you're the offensive lineman and you're trying to get this guy to move, right? But when your feet are constantly in motion, um, it makes it a little bit easier to, to kind of anchor and, and generate that power and just be a little bit more flexible and adaptable. All your, your feet are already always in a, in a, a cycle of being picked up and put down. So you can pick them up and put them down wherever you need to, depending on what force you're trying to take. Um, but the next thing that I want you to do is to be able to transfer your weight from one side to the other really, really, really quickly. This is especially important for gap and a half, or you might know it as Jimmy Pony. If you've watched that one Carl Scott clinic on YouTube, which by the way, if you want to watch, uh, just look up Carl Scott, Alabama, Carl with a K former D backs coach for the Vikings, uh, and also for Alabama. And if you look that up on YouTube, you'll find a really, really, really cool thing that will, will open your mind a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a really cool starting point for because it's like a day one install for coverages and stuff. I'm getting distracted, um, but they call it Jimmy Pony when you're playing gap and a half. So that means uh, that you will have your primary gap. You're the place that's like if the run comes, that's my job. And then you'll have a secondary gap that if the run goes up there, you got to flash across the offensive lineman's face and get into the gap. And usually there's somebody else that also has that gap as a secondary gap. So the two of you should meet and then you'll be able to combine on the tackle. And uh, what one of the things you have to do there is you have to be able, you have to have your weight fully planted in your primary gap and be able to push off of it and then shift your weight over into your secondary gap so that if the run does come up that way, you're ready with your entire weight to accept the running back and start taking him down and like accept that contact and survive it. Um, He's really good at this. He's really disciplined at this, at having his weight exactly where he's supposed to be and then flashing it across. It could be a scotch faster, and sometimes a running back will get by him. Um, but he's doing the right thing. He just needs to be just like a tick faster about it, which uh, will come in time. It's a very, very minor issue. The other thing when you're in whatever your primary gap is, is you want to keep your hips square best you can, especially when you are like shooting a gap. Um, and boy, Chop Robinson shoots some gaps. One of the most fun things that he does on a whole bunch of plays, if a team is trying to run any kind of gap scheme at him, which what I mean by that is anything with a pulling offensive lineman. And, and if you talk to guards about like their favorite plays, it's the ones where they get to pull because usually they just get to ear hole the absolute crap out of a guy <laughs> because that's that's trap, that's counter, that's power where they get to to, to get ahead of steam and launch headlong into somebody, right? But to do that, they have to get across all the gaps. So there's a whole bunch of plays where a guard will, you know, pull from the backside and start running across the way, you know, Holland asked the way he's supposed to. And Chop Robinson will just 
knife up the B gap like he's Aaron freaking Donald <laughs> and get in the in the puller's way and actually disrupt the puller. And now the puller can't block who he's supposed to block, and whoever the puller was supposed to block gets to make the tackle. And it's, he just exploded the entire play just via get off. It's so cool. And it's just so exhausting to play against him. That's really the vibe that I get. But one of those things when you are trying to like actually park yourself in a gap and you're not just getting penetration and blowing things up is you want to make sure that your hips stay square uh, if, as long as they can. You don't always have the luxury of keeping your hips square. Sometimes you have to, you're getting double teamed and you have to kind of get yourself skinny and you'll have to move your hips away that way. But but as soon as you're through that double team, if you've gotten skinny and you've sort of wriggled your way through the double team, get your hips back square again because it allows you, you can break left, you can break, break right. Um, it's harder to move you right versus if you get pushed from behind because your hips are facing the sideline and somebody can come up from behind you and push you, you're going to get moved a little bit more. Um, Chop is usually pretty disciplined about this, but sometimes he will have to get his hips very, very, uh, he like, he's, he does such aggressive things. He'll knife across two gaps and try to shoot the gap that way. And to do that, you got to commit your hips fully. You can't stay square and like strafe your way over when you're doing stuff that, that, that's that aggressive. And then somebody will get, get him from behind and he'll end up on the ground and it'll look, look like this really, really ugly rep. And I think it's just that he's getting greedy and he's trying to do too much, which again, that is the mentality. Like I'm, I love the mentality. <laughs> I love the idea that, you know, the, the world is my oyster. It's just something you do when you feel like you own every single gap and you own the field today and you can go wherever you want because you're just that much more of a dog than everybody else. Um, but, you know, maybe like, calm down a little bit. But I don't want you to calm down, like, generally. I just want you to be a little bit more judicious. Another kind of minor thing. It's not that much. Um, there are a couple other weaknesses that I want to talk about, and I want to talk more about hip angle. So, um, yeah, we're, we, we still got work to do here. Today's episode of Locked on Vikings is brought to you by BetterHelp. Therapy can be a different experience for everyone, and everybody's needs are different. Some people may just need to talk about how the Vikings make them mad. That's actually perfectly valid and kind of what it's for. The thing about therapy is it's for whatever's bugging you, whether it's something real, some kind of family issue or something like that, or whether it's just, gosh, I really don't know how I feel about the Vikings. Are they going to go try to be, do the competitive rebuild again and you're really mad about it? Like, that's perfectly fine. But you need to make sure that you link up with a therapist that knows exactly what it is that you need. And that's what BetterHelp is for, for helping hook you up with somebody that's right for you. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. If you go around to any of the scouting reports that have already been written on Chop Robinson, and I'm sure more will kind of keep cropping up here by the day, you're going to find a lot of people talk about how he's kind of slender, and it's that slender frame makes them a little bit worried as an edge rusher. And the fact that he's not running at like 260 and he's running at more probably 250 is uh, probably the single thing I think dropping him down draft boards, which I think is insane. Because when you think about a guy like a, a bigger edge rusher versus a smaller edge rusher, what you don't feel like you get from the smaller edge rusher is, is pads popping, right? You don't get that knockback. But if you watch a tackle that is set up and is trying to punch on, on Chop Robinson, even a good tackler, a tackle playing well, you will see him get the hands up into that guy's chest and his shoulders will knock back and his posture will be ruined. You'll ruin that spine angle. And if you think about like leverage, right? If, if I take, you know, take your hands and make a timeout with them, basically, uh, which hand is enacting more force onto which hand when you do that, right? So when you get those hand, the, the, your hands into, um, into your opponent's chest and you're the one enacting more force, you can tell. And it doesn't matter how many weights this guy's, this guy lifts. If you get that leverage on him, I've seen chop Robinson walk back forklift and discard dudes, 50, 60, 70 pounds heavier than him. I do not care about his listed weight at all. What I do care about is if he can kind of hold his ground in situations where it does just kind of come down to power. And I think when he's set up and he can get his legs behind him and he can chop his feet, which makes you stronger, and he can chop his arms, which makes it harder to get purchase on you, makes you harder to move. He does all that stuff really well, which can which goes a long way toward making up for that that I guess you'd call it deficiency of like 15 pounds versus his peers. 
Um, when he pass rushes, he does get bumped off of his path a little bit sometimes. Um, what you like the ideal pass rushing path, if you think about like edge rusher starts outside the tackle, he wants to go up past the tackle. He wants to essentially wherever the quarterback has dropped back to, you want to turn on a right angle there. You want to flatten right out and you want to hit that guy like right on that yard line, right? You want a good flash, flat pass rushing angle and you want to get to that flat pass rushing angle uh, really quickly, right? So you want to take a direct path to it. He'll get bumped off that direct pass sometimes and it'll slow him down. Not so great. Um, I think one way to help him with this is not, like the last thing I want to do is ask him to gain weight. I mean, obviously you want to get stronger, you want to hit the, the weight room all the time, but I don't want to put him on a diet that that makes him the more quote-unquote prototypical size and, and, and length for an edge rusher. I think quote-unquote pro, prototypical size is a heavily overrated concept. Uh, it's obviously nice, but... I, I don't need you to be big. I need you to be strong. Those are two very different things. Chop Robinson, insanely strong. We're going to be all right if his listed weight doesn't exactly fall right on the biggest part of the bell curve. Um, but one way to help him get uh, knocked off his path a little bit more, one, it might just not matter because he's really, really fast so he can make up for that lost ground. Uh, but to keep his hips or to, to get his hips turned toward his opponent a little bit faster. So again, this is a hip angle thing. You want your hips, once you get, once you're trying to like dip underneath a tackle, whether it's like dip and rip, or you're just trying to get your shoulder around because you're trying to win with speed, um, you want your hips to very quickly turn their way toward the quarterback. And what you want to see is the inside foot when you get around a guy, that inside foot should be able to like turn on a really, really crazy angle. It takes a, fle a certain flexibility to like I physically can't do it as I'm like sitting here trying to do it. I don't have that flexibility. Um, so it takes a certain athleticism that I don't think you get to be successful as an edge rusher without. So you're probably going to see it pretty universally uh, to place that foot in the right direction. If your inside foot, if that toe is pointing right at the quarterback, at that point, you just drive your feet and that toe will lead you where you want to go, right? Your, your toe leads you where you want to go. That's like a, an adage of defensive line coaches. Um, and what maybe can help him is if he does that toe thing, which he does. He does it very well and it gets his hips turned around and he can really, really, really tightly round that corner, which is something you should be looking for. And he's got it. Um, you know, quarterback doesn't step up. He's going to get blasted. That, that will happen. But... If he does that toe thing a little bit earlier, he will be better able to accept a punch from a kick sliding tackle and he'll round that corner a little bit faster. He might have to go through that tackle a little bit more. He won't be able to win with speed as much, but with how many other things that he does with his hands and good habits that he has, I'm okay with that. And I think that that can like work out and be all right. So that's one thing that uh, I, I guess is... I, I do think it's probably the biggest issue is that he gets bumped off his pass rush lane sometimes. Uh, but I think people are responding way too much to it because it is attached to like an objective measurable number, which makes it feel a lot more real to people. But I don't think that makes it more impactful necessarily. It's just easier to prove and explain. Um, another thing that I like, so I, I like that he can stack a guy up and really like every time his, his hands hit you, it's violent. There's even a rep against Ohio State where he gets through the line. It's a quick, like one step drop and throw. So he's never going to get to the quarterback, but he still, he like knifes through a gap and just beats a tackle like crazy. And he just gets a hand on the quarterback just as a kind of love tap, even after the ball is thrown, hope the ref doesn't see me. And it's so violent. The quarterback almost falls over. Like he, he just, it's violent all of the time, which is part of why he's so exhausting. Um, but when he actually sheds what I personally like, and there are people who will disagree with me on this, so don't take it to the bank because other, like there are coaches who will be like, no, 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 what he does is perfectly fine, but I, I don't prefer it. Um, he will try to essentially rip to shed. So he'll, he'll get your, his hands in your pads. He'll knock you back. And then he wants to rip his hand underneath you and shed you that way. I don't think that has enough influence on the guy. And when you are somebody as violent with their hands as Chop Robinson is, I prefer you to rip the guy down in a way with, I shouldn't use the word rip, to, to snatch the guy down in a way. Snatch is maybe a better word. Um, to, to 
you know, you've you've got him by the pads, basically. Grab his jersey. You'll never get called for holding by this, uh, doing this, by the way. So don't worry about it. You'll, you'll, they'll never see it. Um, grab his jersey and yank down and away from where the running back is. And essentially put him back in your hip pocket. Put your hands back in your hip pocket. Or you, you imagine like you have a sword that you're putting back in its sheath, right? Or that celebration. Is it a seatbelt or is it a sword? This is a, a, a hot topic of debate. This celebration that defensive backs do all, the, all day now. Uh, is it either a sword in the sheath or is it a seatbelt because they're locked up? I don't know. Um, but whatever it is, you do that motion really, really fast and violently. You get that offensive line's weight up in front of his toes. He's got to catch himself. He's totally out of the play and you're free to make the play, right? I would rather see that, um, but that's a personal preference for me. There are reasons to do that rip. It's a little bit faster. It takes a little bit less effort, so sure. But I think that he has the strength to pull that off and I think he can make better use of just how violent he is. I love this guy. Now, he's he is, I, I have him way higher than anybody has him right now and i'm perfectly comfortable with that and if he doesn't work out then i'll find out i'll I'll, I'll figure out why and learn from it right that's how the draft works but man i just cannot get enough chop robinson uh if he is the kind of guy that falls to the second round because he's 15 pounds too light and the vikings get him at 43 we are doing backflips we are flying high all right we are ascending to a new plane if that happens but personally i don't even know if he falls to 11 because once he tests, everybody's going to pretend that they were on him all the time. But just you and me were, all right? We get to be hipsters about it now because we were on this before the combine. I will see you all next week. And as always, Skull.